This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 71. Welcome to the 71st episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. One of the most common questions I get from my listeners is how long will it take for my period to come back after I get off the pill or after I stop taking hormonal contraceptives? So I decided to create an awesome resource that tackles this tough question and it's free when you sign up for the Fertility Friday newsletter. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash ebook to get your free copy of my new ebook, Where That Is My Period? Five Ways to Restore Your Menstrual Health and Fertility After Going Off the Pill, where I reveal what to expect when coming off of hormonal contraceptives, and I also share five steps to restoring healthy menstrual cycles post-pill. I did take a little bit of a risk with the title, but I wanted to express and acknowledge the sheer frustration that I feel from my listeners and readers who are coming off the pill only to find that their menstrual cycles are a mess. So my ebook provides a bit of a roadmap and gives some insight as to why your period didn't just bounce back the second you stopped taking those hormones. And also, if you've been enjoying the show, I would love it if you take a moment and leave a review and a rating on iTunes. It helps the show to move up in rankings so that more people can find it. And I would like to say a special thank you to all the listeners who've left reviews already. I do read all of your reviews and I really appreciate you taking the time to let me know how I'm doing. And in today's show, I'm very excited to welcome Claire Blake. Claire is the founder of Fertility Massage Therapy. Fertility Massage Therapy combines massage and emotional healing to enhance successful conception using techniques such as abdominal sacral massage, pulsing reflexology, and guided visualizations. And after qualifying as a holistic massage therapist in the United Kingdom, Claire became one of the few qualified therapists in abdominal sacral massage, which is for fertility massage, and she continued to train in numerous bodywork styles before studying naturopathy and the Billings ovulation method in Australia, and that provided her with a deeper understanding of women's health. And in today's show, we'll be talking about the program she developed, so fertility massage therapy, as well as how incorporating naturopathy and the Billings ovulation method has informed her practice. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Claire. Thank you, Lisa. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and how you actually came to develop fertility massage therapy. Okay, so um, about eight or nine years ago, um, I had a little accident, and so I couldn't use my hands for bodywork anymore, so I trained as a doula. And whilst I was doing that training, I read a lot of books on conscious conception, and it really got me interested in the emotional side of how women needed to be emotionally prepared, but also allow their wombs to be healed um, so they could bring in their babies in a, in a, in a more beautiful way. Um, so I'd done a lot of bodywork training and I had trained in this abdominal sacral. Um, and it, it just was one of those things that naturally evolved that whilst I was working with people, I started to bring in a lot more of the energetics work. So the visualizations, um, to, to help women to connect to their wombs and to connect to their babies. So it became more of a, a passion around, around that, um, and then over the years, the, the massage moved from just being what was abdominal sacral um, to becoming fertility massage therapy because I brought in different techniques, um, pulsing and rebozo, um, and made the massage a lot more feminine, a lot more fluid, um, a lot more about a dance between um, myself as a body worker and my client and about connecting in and getting in rhythm with each other. Um, so. It, it, when I teach my students, um, I you know it's about coming out of the head when we're working and coming down into our womb space and our intuition and knowing how that woman needs to be massaged and how they need to be touched um, because women we don't have our mass, our abdomens massaged we don't really like it um, we don't really like our bellies in, in, as a whole um, so it was about really giving love and nurturing and helping women to start to love and nurture their own bodies. And through that as well, we teach them self-care. Um, so yeah, it's, there's no real one simple answer. It was just a, a real journey for me. Um, mm. and I gave birth, uh, six years ago. And when I gave birth, it was, it was like the energy within me shifted and I could access just different wisdom. Um, and that has really shifted and changed how I work and what I deliver and, and what I teach students as well now. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love to delve a little bit deeper into the emotional aspects of it. 
um, something that you said about how women have this kind of negative association with their bellies. It's so true. It's one of the area that so many women, one of the areas that so many women just, they're just not happy with, right? Whether it's because they have stretch marks if they have given birth or if they have belly fat or anything like that, let alone actually thinking of connecting with their wombs. So why did that aspect of it become so important in your practice? I think it is that realization um, that women were just so disconnected. Um, and I think it was uh, over time I realized that when I could help women connect to their wombs or to their bodies, um, that where they'd been having, uh, you know, infertility issues, whether it was, you know, unexplained infertility or whatever, um, suddenly they were getting pregnant. And they were saying they could feel that those shifts were that that shift in their mindset, in in their in their emotional aspects, um, and allowing their bodies to kind of be an open vessel and not just treating their bodies as these as these uh, machines. Um, and and I think as well, the more women you massage, I massaged, you know, you massaged all different shapes and sizes and. The women that really, really loved the massage were the larger women who would literally cry and say, I've never had anybody love my belly the way that you do. Um, and it's much more pleasurable, actually, for, for <laughs> us to massage a woman that's got you know some belly fat on them. And, you know, we have this idea that we should all look like these supermodies and be super skinny. Um, but actually, when we look through, you know, pictures from, you know, or paintings from many years ago, centuries ago, women had curves. And, you know, even Marilyn Monroe had a beautiful figure. And she had, she loved exposing her, her curves. And she was known as the goddess. You know, she was a, a beautiful woman. So it's trying to change that mind, mindset. But a lot of my, my changes are about how we think about our wombs and our menstrual cycles. And that's where the biggest differences come in, um, is that shift in how we think about what it is to be a woman. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Do you want me to, I can go into that a little bit more? I can. <laughs> well, it's, it's just so interesting. I've obviously doing this podcast, I've had a lot of really interesting conversations on so many different topics with a lot of really amazing women. That's one of the like, I'm so fortunate to be able to do that. And I did have a conversation with um, one of my mentors, Geraldine Mattis, and we talked about that whole idea of how uh, women are disconnected from their bodies, but also how women kind of commodify their bodies in the sense of thinking of their womb, for example, as like a, a means to an end, right? <laughs> thinking of it like a, um, like a machine that is just supposed to work, like we're just supposed to turn it on when we're ready by stopping hormones. And then it's just supposed to like produce a child for us. And, <laughs> and we don't yeah. really stop to think that it's a part of my body. So I think that's the part of what you're saying that's really kind of hitting for me. Because now we're talking about not only emotionally connecting, but physically connecting with our with our wombs and why that's important. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think about um, and I often kind of talk about this with, uh, with with my students when I do talks about when we're a little girl and we're maybe four or five years old and we walk in and we see our mother you know, maybe on the bathroom and, you know, and she's got her, her Tampax or her sanitary pad and the mum gets all embarrassed and doesn't want to talk about her period. And so it's that first time that the daughter has kind of seen something kind of feminine, doesn't really know what it is, but the mother has kind of been shameful about it or, you know, you know, it's disgusting. They just hide it. And so the child doesn't need to know about it. Um, and then when we become a teenager, you know, often we get our first bleed and you know, in, in tra traditional cultures, they honour these with ceremonies and they do a monarch ceremony. And, you know, all the women would come together and celebrate this beautiful girl coming from a girl and changing into her maiden uh, and becoming a woman. Whereas most Western people, you know, the mother might kind of give them a pack of Tampax or, you know, sanitary pads and um, tell them to get on with it talk about it negatively and say, oh, it's a curse or it's painful. They'll kind of do something that's negative. Um, and so that then affects the whole relationship that we have with our menstrual cycles. We see them as painful. We try to then numb them down. We go on the pill. We don't connect 
to the wisdom that our wombs have. Um, we don't connect to our hormones. We are just like these, you know, flatlining people. Um, and like you said, and then we, we shut the body down and then, you know, we get to 30 odd and we think, all right, I've got the career, I've got the man, I've got the house, I want the baby. So we come off the pill, but our bodies are not working because they've just been shut down. And then we get angry. And so then we often jump very quickly into maybe IVF um, because obviously that's another solution. We'll just, you know, medicate our bodies some more. And I get that IVF is there uh, for some people and it really is needed, but sometimes it's it's we go into it too quickly. And so, again, it's another mechanical thing that's been done to us rather empowering us to know our bodies, know what's going on with our cycles, know, know when we're fertile rather than just peeing on a stick and saying, oh, look, I've got a smiley face. Mm. It's about really knowing our own bodies. And that should start, like I've got a five-year-old daughter. She, I wear beautiful cloth pads uh, when I'm having my moon time. And she has her own version of little cloth pads that she loves to wear. And she, you know, she loves to run around saying, I've got my moon time. And she's all excited about it because I talk about it as a really positive thing. And I explain to her what my body is doing. Um, and she knows that she came from within my womb. So she has this understanding that there's no fear around it. Um, and I think that if we could change that amongst you know, the next generation, uh, lots of girls would start to honour their cycles. They'd start to honour their bodies. They wouldn't sleep around. Um, they wouldn't medicate so much. They would be more in tune. Um, and they would kind of stand in their power. It, there's a huge shift that could happen if we as mothers now could shift how we are with our daughters and um yeah I felt like I've just got on my soapbox then <laughs> oh but that was so, that's so beautiful I think that just that story alone you don't know how many lives you know you could have changed even like unborn daughters by women hearing that story and really thinking wow what if I had had that experience yeah. um because I have a three-year-old and they play with everything and that's how they learn and so the it's beautiful what you said about how your daughter has her own version of her but because then she gets to play and she really gets to explore that in her yeah. youthful innocence and kind of develop a positive relationship uh with herself before the world tries to tear that away from her <laughs> yeah. just let them try <laughs> yeah exactly and another point you know in there with this topic as well is that for some reason i feel like women We've all been brainwashed to think that our our wombs, our reproductive organs are separate from ourselves, right? Um, yeah. That we can actually um, shut them down and kind of treat them in such a way as if they weren't part of us. And they actually are part of us. They make us who we are. Um, you know, if our hormones are off, our, our moods are off. So they're actually control, to, not control, yeah. but they make up part of who we are, even the expression of our our happiness, our sadness, our sexual drives. And I think that is so forgotten in what you said about women standing in their power, right? Like remembering who we are and imagine if we you like imagine if we were connected with our bodies and we actually opened our eyes and kind of explored that a little bit. I think the world would be a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. That's my that's my aim, hopefully, <laughs> you know. Every bit by bit by bit. <laughs> well, I, I'd love to switch gears a little bit then and get into the actual fertility massage therapy. I know that you mentioned that you started with the abdominal sacral. So maybe you could tell us yeah. a little bit about what that is. Yeah. So uh, when we're doing the physical work of the of the massage, we work on the sacral area um, because the nerves that feed through from the lower lumbar and the sacrum feed directly into the reproductive and the digestive system. And so it means that if one area like we've got so we've got constipation then those nerves are going to be affecting the reproductive and the lower back and so we may end up with lower back pain and we may end up with reproductive pain um, so we work that whole area to get as much uh, blood flow as much circulation as much nerve flow to our reproductive and digestive system um, then when we work the front we are working from the pubic bone up to the rib cage and we're really working on um, opening up and relaxing the diaphragm so that we can get as much blood flow down into the body. But also we're stimulating all of the organs that are within our abdominal cavity um, and getting the digestive system to flow because the digestive system is so important for uh, for fertility but also for general health. Um, we have um, 
80% of our immune system is in our digestive tract. Um, and so when our digestive system isn't working well, then our immune system isn't going to be working well. So we want to boost the digestive system um, to get the immune system working well as well. But also uh, 90% of our serotonin is in our digestive system. And so, again, if we're sluggish, if we're not having good bowel motions, um, or if we're, you know, if our bowel motions are either we've constipated or we've got really small, uh, like small bowel motions, then we know that we've got impacted feces, which means that the good nutrients are not able to get through the intestinal walls. And that also means that all the hormonal levels, so the things like the serotonin, is going to be less. Um, and so that will affect our mood. So we want to get that real boost um, through the digestive system. And then the circulation into the womb, we, a lot of the womb um, is kind of obviously tucked behind uh, the pubic bone, but we can get to the, the fundus, the head of the womb, and the floping tubes and the ovaries. Um, and we work directly over that area. We use techniques like pulsing, and pulsing is uh, like a rocking of the body. It allows the body to give way. It allows the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments that are holding tight to gently be released and relaxed. Um, and we break down scar tissue and adhesions. Uh, so people that um, have like endometriosis and fibroids, it is beneficial for them um, because we're helping to break down those those hardened and hardened areas where they've got a lot of congestion. Um, and also within Chinese medicine, they talk about cold wombs and how with a cold womb you can't, uh, you know, you can't conceive. Um, so we really want to boost as much circulation into our womb. We only get 5% blood flow into our womb and that's when there's no congestion. Mm -hmm. So if we're not breathing fully down into our abdomen because our diaphragm, diaphragm is tight or if our digestive system is tight, um, then we're not getting that blood flow. So by working that whole abdominal area, we're working on bringing as much blood flow down so that we can boost the circulation into the womb, the floping tubes and the ovaries um, and get that hormonal flow as well. So it's the, the, you know, the, the key benefits really from the physical point are the uh, improving circulation, improving the positioning of the womb um, and, and, and easing up any tension so that the womb is able to move. She should be able to move within our pelvis. We want her to be able to move backwards and forwards. Um, uh, and during the month, that should be the, that should be the case that she could be able to lift up so that we don't get those symptoms just before our bleed. Um, some women get uh, headaches, they get lower back pain, they get constipation, and that will show us that the womb is sitting backwards and sit like so retro retroflexed or retroverted. Um, or some women may get really <laughs> weak bladder, um, and so that will show that the womb is sitting forwards. So what we want to do is be able to move the womb gently. It's a very, very gentle massage, and it's doing it with permission, but it's also given, giving that space in the pelvis that the womb can move around freely throughout the month. Um, um, maybe you could – I got into that concept a little bit with Rachel Eyre, and it yeah. <laughs> kind of – um, I remember being like, wow, that's so cool. I didn't really realize how kind of, you know, mobile the, the uterus is. So maybe you could just d deep into that a little bit and just tell us a little bit about how a uh, healthy, so, uh, you know, if a woman has kind of a healthy womb with the appropriate range of motion and, you know, no adhesions or, you know what I mean, um, what it would, what it would look like in terms of movement and how that would facilitate, you know, her menstrual flow or even conception. Okay, so when the womb is able to sit in a good position, if, she, if she's sitting upright, then when you get your bleed every month, um, you should have very, very minimal cramps because if she's sitting upright and in the perfect position, she'll be able to squeeze her womb just gently and the ligaments that are either side are healthy and so they will move with the womb as she contracts to allow that blood to come out. And that blood will come out as a bright red fresh blood flow just straight away and when she finishes she should be a bright red blood flow but if the womb is sitting and she's maybe flexed which is where she's kind of hunched over she would be pooling the lining from the month before and so the the period would start with maybe a bit of brown spotting at the beginning of your cycle and then if you're still getting brown spotting at the end of your cycle 
that would show that you've got months and months of old lining that is still trying to come away. Um, so the other thing you would get is probably more cramping because if she's sitting in an, you know, not in the optimal position, she's pulling on those ligaments. And so every time she cramps, those ligaments are going to pull and that's going to affect the nerves. And so you're going to get a lot more um, like pain sensation either through the back or the front of the pelvis area and as she cramps to release the lining. Um, so the ideal is that you um, you can flow up to your bleed. The, maybe you have the emotional aspects, you know, you may feel tired, um, kind of wanting to retreat into your own cave, but you should not really have any pain. Um, and then you should finish again like it should be, you know, a nice clean finish, a clean start, sorry, and a clean finish. Hmm. Um, so people that suffer with things like, you know, the constipation, like I said, the constipation, the lower back pain, it just shows that the womb is sitting in a place that's, you know, not optimal. So she's sitting backwards. Okay. And then for women who say work at, you know, your typical desk job, so they end up, you know, <laughs> sitting for six to eight hours a day or more and then come home and sit in front of the TV or sit at the computer, <laughs> sit in the car. Yeah. How does sitting uh, affect that? Because it sounds like it, it, it could potentially have an yeah. impact. Absolutely. Um, sitting is obviously, it's, it's a posture. We, I, as you said that, I sat more upright in my chair, <laughs> reminding myself. Um, you know, it's very easy to slump back. And actually, if you think about your pelvis and you think that your pelvis is just then tilting backwards, and that, all, that means that your womb inside is going to move and tilt backwards. Because if we think about the womb during non-menstruation, she's one to two ounces in weight. But when she's menstruating, she's two to four ounces in weight. But then if you've got fibroids, she can be, you know, double that, triple that. Um, and so that, that increased weight pressure will move her and sl she'll slump even more. So if we're, if our posture isn't in a good place, and if we're not doing uh, good core exercises, things like Pilates and yoga or seeing functional training, um, like functional exercises that really work on strengthening the core, all of that whole core area, the pelvic floor is all going to get weak. And so the womb, again, is going to just shift back. But the other one that's a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit of a nasty one for our wombs is high heels. Mm. Because, again, if we go up on high heels, we're continually tilting our pelvis um, in the wrong position, really. And, again, our wombs just want to have, or our whole bodies actually, really want to have some, some flat time where we're walking bare feet so that we're kind of feeling that natural flow through our body um but we we do need to do you know good core exercises to help support around the whole of that pelvis area um and one thing i do say to my clients is you know if you love doing the whole gym exercising and the, and the weight training in the days leading up to your bleed when your womb is getting heavier and heavier you don't want to be running you certainly don't want to be going pounding the streets. You don't want to be doing heavy weightlifting or um, headstands or anything like that in yoga. You really want to honour with maybe during that time you do more flexibility, mobility work, some gentle work. Um, and it's not that we're giving an excuse that because we've got a period we can't exercise. It's honouring the fact that our womb is getting heavier. And if we do those exercises, we are creating uh, an impact on those ligaments that are holding our womb in place. Um, so it's, it's always quite nice for me personally when I get my bleed. I can actually have a couple of days off of, of training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a great excuse. Um, but it, it's also looking at exercises, hobbies that people do, horse riders, gymnasts. Um, you know, they have that impact as they're bouncing up and down or often more on a horse rather than gymnastics. But, um, you know, I live in an area where there's a lot of horse riders um, and, you know, I kind of say to them, don't do it in that lead up to your bleed because it's that impact where you're kind of trotting up and down and like you're bouncing. If you think about your womb, kind of is like a balloon that's filled with water and she's on like two strings. She's kind of having to really and those strings over time are like rubber bands are going to loosen or, you know, and kind of have that impact. Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts kind of on that. One of the things you said about, you know, kind of changing the way that you exercise, you know, based on your uh, cycle. And it doesn't mean that you're, you know, being whatever the association is, because there's this idea that we should be like pushing through the pain and we should be going hard all the time. And, you know, you shouldn't let your period 
Um, you know, and because, you know, you don't want to use your period as an excuse to like slack off, but (laughs) whatever that means, but maybe you could talk a little bit because before we were talking about kind of tuning into the wisdom of our bodies and kind of, and and what you said, which is kind of honoring your cycle and those types of things. So maybe you could talk about how that interplays because a lot of women struggle with, um, period pain, a bit of fatigue, bloating, just general kind of discomfort around their menstrual cycle. And then obviously in our world, you're, we're not really allowed to take a day off. So then, you know, take medication, take the Advils to force us to push through it and keep going. So what are your thoughts on kind of yeah. the wisdom? What are our bodies trying to tell us? Absolutely. Um, you know, you've got to think, I don't know if in the States you have the same kind of adverts as us, you know, things like the Tampax or whatever, or the Lillettes, whatever they are. And it's, you know, you can still go rollerblading and we'll do all the water sports and you can do all of these activities because you can use, you know, the Tampax to kind of block it out so you're not going to have your bleed. But actually, they're obviously done by real masculine driven media companies that um, that are not honouring our cycles. And so to honour our cycles, it's if we go back many, many years ago and we think about all the women that used to bleed at the same time, they would all bleed with a dark moon. And they would all go into their local communities in their local tents and the women that were bleeding would rest. They would be looked after. Someone would nurture them by bringing their food. Uh, They wouldn't be doing any of the housework. Um, The men knew to leave them alone and that they would do their chores. And it was a time for women coming together and sharing stories, being heard, sitting in a sisterhood. Um, and it's something that is starting to come back up again now. You know, we're starting to look at these red tents and women are coming together on a monthly basis. And even though they might not be bleeding at that point, they are honouring who they are as women. Um, and it's about knowing what our phases of our cycle actually means. Um, you know, so it is about retreating. Our our bleed time is also known as like our season of our winter, where at winter time we want to just snuggle up. We want to kind of be in our cave. We want to be in our own homes. We want to be in our pyjamas. We want to watch, you know, romantic films. We want to read books and eat chocolate. We just want to kind of really just slow down. Um, We don't want to socialise with people. We just want to be, it's about being inwards and it's about intuitively slowing down so that we can actually hear what it is that uh, our wombs are trying to tell us. So if I'm going to kind of go around the cycle and then it will make more sense as I go there. So as we go into our pre-ovulation, that's known as our spring. And that's the time when um, when we start to get new ideas. We start to feel a little bit more energetic and we kind of, you know, our energy is about socialising. We've got a lot of excitement. We want to socialise with everybody. We're really good at talking. Um and then when we get to what's known as our summer, which is our ovulation, that's that's full moon. That's when we're at the height of our creativity. And so anything that we've kind of thought about doing when we're in our bleed time kind of can come to fruition at our, at our ovulation. It's also the height of our, um, you know, our sexuality. We really want to have sex around that time because Mother Nature gave us that gift so that we knew when to have sex to make a baby. Um <laughs> And then, and, and we're really still, we're still outwards with our energy, but it's a little bit more grounded and focused. But then we head inwards and we go into autumn, which is our premenstrual. And this is the, uh, really the interesting phase because a lot of women struggle with, uh, with their premenstrual. You know, it's, it's that shadow. We start to go inwards. Um, and we get, we've got a little critic inside our head that says, um, oh, you, you don't look good in that. Don't wear that. Or no, you can't do this talk or you can't write a book, or you can't do this. And they're very, it's that little critic inside us that kind of really nags us. And we kind of think, oh, goodness, you know, I know I am no good. Um, but also we can be a little bit more narky. We can be a little bit more argumentative. So our darling husbands uh, who may not put the dishwasher on, mm-hmm. you know, or they might not put the dish in the dishwasher, you know, they can do that for the rest of the month and we can cope with that. But if they do it in our premenstrual phase, <laughs> low, <laughs> low, watch out because it's the shadow of ourselves. It's kind of like the uh, Carly, Carly, the goddess, that kind of rah, mm-hmm. um, she, she comes out and, you know, pop, our poor men kind of, you know, they cop it. Um, but really what she's kind of coming out and saying is, um, you know, I'm coming to tell you, What isn't working in your life? So this will be the time when you start to really think about, do do I really like that job? 
do I do I really want to be friends with that person? Is our editing phase? So, you know, if we've got lots of friends on Facebook, for example, that like to take pictures of themselves, save selfies and their food, we might kind of edit them off of Facebook at that time because <laughs> we start going, oh, you really, you're wasting my time. Um, and we can't, but then we might get back around to ovulation and friend them again because we feel bad. Um, but it's looking at what is coming up for us in that. So what niggles us? in our autumn phase and then when we take it into our bleed again because we're in that quiet place we can sit and think about what is it that came up for us what do i need to release because physically when we release our bleed we're releasing that lining but we are energetically releasing all that we've taken on for that whole month and then we're letting it go and so if we don't slow down and if we don't listen to our bodies throughout the month and we don't honour our menstrual cycle, then our bodies are going to give us painful periods and problems with our periods because it's our womb literally screaming out at us, you're not listening to me. Um, And so she will create a bit of pain. So that's the energetics of um, the menstrual cycle. And I'd like to honour Alexandra Pope, who taught me this work, and uh, she is called Menstruality. Um, and so with her permission, I do get to share that work. Uh, but it's beautiful. And there's a lot of really good books. There's a lot of good resources out there. Um, and I do urge any woman you know, to, to get out there and to learn about their menstrual cycle in this way, because it is fascinating. Um, and it changes your life because suddenly, you know, if you've got a business meeting, you know to do that in your spring or your summer. Um, and you know to organise parties for that time. But also you need to look at your diary and go, OK, I know I'm really believing then. I'm not going to socialise at that point. I'm going to honour myself by watching Bridget Jones for the hundredth time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I appreciate you so much for sharing that. Um, As you were talking, I just, it just deeply resonated with me um, because I haven't been on hormonal birth control, you know, since I was like 18. So I have fully had that experience um, just over and over again for like the last 15 (laughs) years. And um, I wrote a, a blog post about it a long time ago, well, maybe not that long, but um, to, to kind of share my experience, because I feel like a lot of women are kind of robbed of that wisdom um, that their their menstrual cycles can bring to their lives. Um, one of the things that you talked about in autumn, so in our you know post ovulatory premenstrual phase, is that anything that isn't working in your life is kind of brought to your attention. And I really found that in a big way throughout my life. Uh, so before my, my period, if I didn't like my job or if um, maybe I was dating someone that, you know, wasn't really right for me, it would come up <laughs> in a big way every month. Um, and it really, I, I would say that it played a, a really key kind of role in terms of moving me forward in my life, right? Because you're really connecting with, if you're listening, you're really connecting with with yourself and you can't just ignore it because it just keeps coming back. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things I've wondered, you know, with so many women being, you know, shutting down that aspect of themselves for, you know, two decades is, you know, what what happens without that wisdom? You know, like, do, does it mean that you end up staying with that guy for an extra 10 years when you shouldn't have? Mm-hmm. Does it mean that you kind of settle in that job? Like, I, I don't know. There's no way to yeah. test that. But what happens if you don't have that internal kind of guidance reminding you? I, I, I just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm completely, I, I, I do, I agree. I, I personally, myself as well, you know, I was on the pill because I wasn't aware um, I was on the pill for a long time and I was living that even though I'd done some, uh, you know, I'd done some of the training in, you know, reflexology and body work, I was still doing my uh, working in the share markets, but I hated it. Um, and then I met my husband and he gave me an article to read on the pill and I came off it that day. Oh, wow. um, and, I, and I got, I saw help from a naturopath who told me what supplements to take, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and that was my big shift. That was when I kind of went, what am I doing? Of course, this is my passion. I love massage. And and I really heard. And all the boyfriends, you know, the ones that you have that you kind of go, really? You're not really connecting with me. But you, you put up with it for a while. But you look back and go, well, it's because I was on the pill. I was so dumbed down and so so flatlined with my hormones that I wasn't really I wasn't really clear. I was just pretending to be this person. So my 20s were just this kind of it's like this fake person. 
Um, so yeah, it's it is so important. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, is that I, I'm something I'm very, very passionate about. Well, and it, it reminded me of something that Katie Singer, you know, said a couple times in our interview, where she just said, you know, the pill makes us to be like these Barbie dolls. And yeah. so when you're talking about kind of feeling like a dumbed down version of yourself, where you're kind of just in a haze, and then you look back and you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, but the pur- the purpose of it as well is to make us available for sex all the time. Um, And then, you know, so that whole, it it really just kind of connected to that whole Barbie doll idea where you're just supposed to kind of be available for sex um, and also just kind of not really, not really have that, that um, period of time in your cycle where you do have that thorny emotional kind of raw state. Not that everybody has it to some degree. And obviously there's, if it's, you know, if, if it's really out of control, that is indicative of a problem. Yes. Um, so it's not to say that you're supposed to turn into a raging monster every month. <laughs> it's not what we're getting at. <laughs> we're not giving you permission to do that. <laughs> but more so actually connecting to what's not working and actually putting a voice to that. Um, mm-hmm. So if you're kind of, the, and I don't know that that, you know, I don't know to what degree, you know, it affects each woman, but these are important questions I think that we should be asking um, either way. So I'm, yeah, I'm just so glad that you brought that up. And I think that just you describing the menstrual cycle in terms of seasons and really going through that, I think that that's going to be a really powerful piece for a lot of our listeners today. And um, so again, to kind of switch gears a little bit, I'd love to talk about then, you know, what made you just, uh, what made you decide to train in the Billings ovulation method and then how that informed your practice? Okay, I... I started doing the billings um, because I was doing naturopathy in Australia, um, and I came just I just met somebody who was talking about the billings ovulation method, and when I kind of questioned the naturopathic teachers, they had no idea, but yet they were training people to kind of be you know specialising within fertility, um, and it kind of made me realise that actually there was a deeper level you know that we needed to understand and, and they were still even though it was naturopath naturopathy sorry and it was very holistic it was still kind of on that science just the science i mean you could see sciencey but um it was just on the nutrition the herbal side and it wasn't really getting to the depths um and billings is, is taught in the uk but it is um mainly taught in australia so i was <laughs> while i was there i figured i'd, I'd learn it um and it was such fascinating it was pro- it was a really cheap course because it is a charity but it gave me such an immense amount of knowledge um it really kind of blew me away and it really made me uh understand my own body to the point that um i realized that no women talked about no one no we, we don't as girlfriends we don't know what's going on we don't talk about the difference in what people, some people call it discharge, but it's not, it's actually, you know, it's our cervical mucus. Um, and I, so I did, I, I've taught a lot of people um, as part of being clients or just even friends and getting people to kind of really get to know their body um, because it gives you such an insight. And I used uh, the billings myself. Uh, I used it for many years with my husband um, as our form of contraception. So I knew exactly when I was fertile um, so I knew that when we could make love um, and, and not worry when we weren't trying to conceive, so that when we were trying to conceive, not only did I know when I was fertile, but because I knew about, um, you know, when to make love to potentially have a girl or a boy, you know, we also timed it around that as well. Um, <laughs> um, just because, you know, to, to put it straight, I would I would have been fine with either gender it's just I'd already always visualized the daughter um she'd always been the one coming to talk to me so um I was like you know I've got to make this visualization correct um but mucus well before before you move on now you have to tell the listeners how to time how to do it okay (laughs) so I'll explain it all in the because I can do it all together um so basically you have your bleed and then after your bleed you tend to have a few days where you're dry uh, most people are dry. They maybe have two or three days where they're dry. And that means that you see nothing, you feel nothing at your vulva. You're not about putting your fingers inside. It's just literally at your vulva. And so your knickers as well will look 
completely clean. There's no, there's nothing in there. And then you move from that and your hormones start to rise. And so you'll start to get some dampness. Um, and so that may show in like a creamy or a stickiness or crumbly uh, kind of mucus. Um, and again, you still feel fairly dry-ish. There's just like a little bit of tackiness. So you'll start to notice that in your knickers, there might be just a little bit of uh, staining. Um, and then say maybe around, uh, just a stereotypical 28-day cycle. So maybe around day 10 or 11, you start to get a lot more damp and wet. Um, and so that increases in the wetness and you get to the slippery. And we have um, maybe three, two to three days of really slippery kind of egg white mucus. Now, everyone gets really worried because they kind of see these books and they see they should be able to stretch their egg white mucus, you know, for inches. Um, but it's not always about seeing it, it's about feeling it. So you'll know then that when you go to the toilet and you have a wee and when you wipe yourself, you sometimes go, oh, I need more toilet roll. You know, I need to wipe myself more because there's that slipperiness there. Or even when you're walking around, you may feel that you've kind of not wet yourself, but you kind of go, oh, I'm really quite damp between my legs. It's that slippery sensation. That is your, that's your fertile, fertile mucus. Then we have the last day of the slippery sensation, and that's your peak. So that's like your when you ovulate. And then the next day it will go back and it will change to dry, sticky, crumbly. It will just mask and change. And it should be like that then for the whole of the luteal phase until you get your bleed again. Now, in order to, for the gender selection, <laughs> in order to get a girl, uh, you would need to make love uh, two to three days prior to ovulation. So the only way you're going to know that is by tracking your cycle for maybe three months and knowing that you have three days of slippery egg white mucus so you would then on the first day of egg white mucus you make love and you don't make love again and the reason is because the sperm that makes a girl has got a big fat head and a short towel so it takes its time swimming up the vaginal canal and into the womb but it can sustain itself for you know three up to three to five days Whereas the sperm that makes a boy has got a small head and a long tail, it whizzes its way up the canal and then kind of like, you know, gets bored <laughs> and just dies off. It can't sustain itself. So if you're going to make, uh, if you're going to create a boy, if you're going to create a boy, <laughs> um, you're going to make love on the day of ovulation or the day after ovulation. And a girl would be, you know, the couple of days before ovulation. Obviously, there are you kind of have to really know your cycle to, to get this right but they did do some studies in Nigeria um, and they took I can't remember how many couples it was it was 90 odd couples and I think they got something like a 94 <laughs> point something percent uh, success rate of getting a girl or a boy using their mucus um, in China it is the Billings method is what isn't used um, and they use the gender selection because obviously um, obviously it doesn't always work, but um, as, a, as a general rule, they they use it because in China they often want boys because of carrying on the family name because they were only allowed to have the one child. Um, so, yeah, it is it is fascinating stuff. People do get a little bit confused with their mucus and um, they it, it's knowing those changes. And so I say people track for three months. It's hard because if you make love the next day, you may think that you've got slippery mucus, but actually that's just the release of the sperm still. Um, so you, you, ne you need to track when you make love so that you know the difference between your own mucus and the sperm. Um, but yeah, there are therapies out there that can, that can guide you more. And I think actually on my, um, I've got an ebook, uh, which is, you can download it for free on my, um, uh, on my website and I think I talk about mucus in there otherwise um, if you contact me I've, I've got the, the guide to fertility book which again is a free book that I give my clients and it tells you how to do mucus tracking in there so I'm happy to happy to share um, it's just about getting people to know this information and and, and love it and not be a, not be frightened to know them you know their own bodies well, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. I don't want to get any emails from the listeners if you try to get a girl and get a boy or if you try yes. to get a boy and get a girl because obviously, you know, you're just kind of increasing your chances. It's not foolproof. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I mean, obviously, they were done under a controlled study and they had guidance on how to, and that's what you have to know I take it. no responsibility for the yeah. gender of your children. Yeah. my dear listeners but um but <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I um 
was exposed to that concept. I think Tony Weschler talks about that a little bit and taking charge of your fertility. So it's really, it's really neat because not only can you, you, it's just amazing the different things that our bodies can do and how, how many different ways that you can use this information. And, um, and I think a lot of my listeners, um, you know, that in of itself is kind of so far off because, uh, when women come off of the birth control pill, it's often, it's, it's very, very common for their cycles not to regulate for quite some time. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, several months, uh, if, you know, several months sometimes for their period to return at all. And then after it does return several months, uh, you know, and, and beyond for their cycles to actually start looking more healthy and robust. So the, the cycle that you described obviously is, is typical in, in a healthy cycle um, yeah. and not necessarily what you would see immediately after coming off of hormonal yeah. birth control. <laughs> yes, um, but maybe, so the Billings ovulation method. So my understanding of Billings is that it's a mucus only method. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, well, I'm terrible at remembering, uh, remembering details. I think it's about 60 years ago, the doctors, uh, Dr. Evelyn and Dr. John Brown, uh, Billings, they, uh, they they found the work with the mucus. And they did it all under, you know, they kind of did the, the um, under the microscope and seen the different types of mucus that there are. So there's uh, four different types of mucus. Um, so there's, there's G mucus, which is the gatekeeper, and it's like the plug. So it's like, you know, that's when you don't feel anything. You have the uh, L mucus, which is the eliminator, and it's like fern-like, and it catches all the all the defunct sperm. It looks around, kind of go, yeah, you're not good enough, and catches them in its web. And then we have the P and the S mucus, and they are kind of what make it uh, slippery and nutritious so that it can uh, look after the sperm and help to carry it. So it's got uh, vertical lines and helps to guide the sperm up into the vaginal canal. So they managed, they, they worked out the four different types of mucus. Um, and then how they kind of flow through uh, different types of cycles. Obviously, they kind of brought in things like breastfeeding cycles and, and ovulatory cycles. Um, and so there's lots of different learnings about about that. Well, yeah. What I think is so interesting about that is that in our cervix, there's different crypts that produce that type of different mucus. But I think it's important to point out that, you know, like the G mucus you don't see, generally speaking. Yeah. Um, that's, that's when you're dry. But then the other three types of mucus... Um, the P, L, and S, they kind of give you the different expressions of the mucus that you see. So when you yeah. see uh, the creamy versus the egg white, it's all variations of the the other three types of mucus. But yeah. I think what's also extremely interesting that you talked about is that um, is that the the different qualities of the mucus and what it does, the important role that it plays in terms of actually allowing the sperm to do what they need to do. So you mentioned nourishing the sperm and then also weeding out the bad sperm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the poor sperm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of it's kind of cool to think that your mucus is kind of like this filter that actually somehow knows which sperm are um, defunct or just not yeah. not healthy and actually prevent them from get, getting access to the fallopian tubes yeah and um just very quickly you said about the pill and it, it can take a long time for that mucus to return because the pill kind of creates um like little blockages against the crypts in the mucus and which so we really want to nourish the cervix to kind of break down those crypts so the mucus can start being performed and you can start coming out of those crypts again. Um, I just kind of wanted to add that little bit in that I forgot to say earlier. So thank you. Well, and I, I also read an article that talks about how the, not only does it block the crypts, but it also changes your cervix itself so that you end up having more G crypts. Yeah. So in English, what that means <laughs> is that, um, you just end up having more like instead of having your a healthy cervix that produces lots of of mucus because you have all the crypts that are supposed to produce lots of mucus you end up having fewer crypts that actually produce healthy mucus is that yeah yeah does that align with your understanding it does indeed perfect yes. yeah so so yeah these are things your doctor doesn't tell you about when you go in and ask what are the side effects of the hormonal birth control yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you're working with clients, then um, many clients come to you with different fertility challenges. What are some of the most common issues that you see in women that uh, you work with? 
Ooh. I'm getting a little run at the moment of uh, Asherman syndrome. And Asherman syndrome, do you know Asherman syndrome is um, some women that have unfortunately had uh, a miscarriage or maybe a traumatic birth and they end up having um, a DNC, like a scrape, and it causes such severe scarring that it could cause the whole of their womb to to scar together. Um, uh but I've had uh, some amazing success with with um, a couple of women on Ashmans. With they had quite severe Ashmans, and um, yeah, one of those has literally just confirmed that she's pregnant. So gone from having no period, um, and everything was blocked. Her blood flowing tubes were blocked, and her her womb was blocked. Um, and we got the scan done, and everything's clear. And then she got pregnant last week. Um, so that obviously is very early days, but that's an amazing one. Um, I see a lot of women. With, um, I, I get to see a lot of women in their forties um, because they they need the support emotionally and physically to go alongside you know the IVF. A lot of unexplained, um, but sometimes you know unexplained to a doctor is not necessarily unexplained to us in the natural because we would look at the <laughs> the emotional side of what's going on. Um, I don't know. It's, it's that's quite a hard question actually because I really do. I get such a huge mixture. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, like I say, the, the and things like endometriosis and fibroids, um, they're, they're quite a huge sector really of my of my clients as well. Well, and I think um, maybe just to touch back on the Asherman syndrome. So, if a woman has uh, you said a traumatic birth, or if they have a DNC which involves the scraping of the yeah. uterus with a, a tool just to make sure to release all the blood uh, um, and not have any kind of leftover because that, that would cause a, a big problem but that in of itself can can lead to scar tissue that can prevent a woman from menstruating or menstruating normally yeah yeah so um depending on how bad the scarring is um it, it will block the cavity within the womb and so they don't so the two women that i have been seeing both of them came originally with no they weren't even having a bleed um and we they, we got them to the stage where it, they were bleeding, mm -hmm. um, and like I say, you know, the other ones had one of them's had scans, so we know that everything has cleared. Much to the dis the dismay of the doctor, who kind of really can't believe that a massage has managed to clear all of that scarring, um, but it, it it has. Um, yeah. See, I'm almost tempted to jump on my soapbox, which is that <laughs> if um if a medical uh, practitioner has a certain belief, such as you're infertile there's nothing you can do then if you manage to find a treatment that works and reverses it it seems like they're more apt to call it a miracle <laughs> than to actually acknowledge that the therapy worked yeah because it doesn't yeah. align with their personal viewpoints about how the world works yeah yeah Ran it's over. um <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know you know that moment when you go yeah I'm, not, I'm i'm gonna be really good and just yeah zip my mouth <laughs> yeah so i opened the box but now i'm closing it and <laughs> but <I'm neither. laughs> we could at that um <laughs> and um one of the questions i wanted to ask is about the self-care aspect so maybe you could talk a little bit about the self-care aspect that you uh, teach to your clients and how that uh, helps as well yeah um, I think it's really amazing for women to do self-care because it's about us empowering ourselves and reclaiming our own bodies. Um, so I teach them uh, how to do a self-care massage. Um, there is a, a, a download version that they can have or I show them in person. Um, and that is a simple massage they can do to themselves. If they wish to, they can do it nightly, but they can, you know, minimum kind of three times a week. And the idea is that they would see me on a monthly basis and do self-care in between because they're going to get better benefits if they are doing the massage on a regular basis. It's cheaper for them. Um, but also it's about them then going, oh, I can feel the difference in my body because under my fingers I can feel that this is not so blocked or hard. I can feel the temperature change, etc. But it's also nice when couples do either on each other or they you know they do to themselves because it allows the man to be part of the fertility journey um so that's that's one aspect um i also love to get women doing things like castor oil packs um and again the uh, the information on castor oil packs you can find it on my website um but it's it's quite a simple uh, castor oil is an old traditional poultice that's been used 
uh, to heat it up onto the abdomen to draw out toxins so it's elimination it's about helping the circulation it's about helping to break down hardened feces hardened scar tissue so it's great for anyone who's got <laughs> kind of any blockages within their digestive and reproductive area um and then yoni steam so a yoni is the tran a sanskrit word for vagina and womb um and so a yoni steam or vaginal steam dear gwyneth paltrow was marvelous at getting that out there in the publicity for us and um because she went and had some done it was all over the papers mm -hmm. so yoni steam it's, it's used for two purposes they're very gentle herbs um it's a way sorry of getting herbs gently into your vagina and your and your womb and it's about drawing out uh, toxins it's about drawing down the old you know pull, clearing the old lining it's about helping the womb come into an upright position it's about nourishing the cervix and and the, the vaginal tissues um but also i use it from an energetic point of view of clearing uh it's, it's our root chakra so our root chakra is uh you know it's it's also our entrance so every time we've ever slept with a man um they leave a little part of their energy within us. So it's about clearing the energy of that man from within us, any bad relationships, if there's been any sexual trauma. Um, it's also about um, focusing on bringing in good energy within. It's like kind of a pagan tradition, really, I guess, in that using bringing in a good energy into your root chakra, so bringing in fertility and love and uh, and clearing guilt, etc. Um, so Yoni steams are lovely to, to do at home as well. Um, so they're the three key things. Um, and then I also get them to do like emotional charting. So as I talked about the menstrual seasons, mm -hmm. you know, getting them to track every day. What are three words that describe your emotions today so that they can start to see their own patterns? And then if they are wanting to, they can also track their mucus um, because, you know, when people are on a fertility journey, sometimes they're doing so much that it can all get a little bit too much. Um so it's choosing the things that they can do without getting stressed because if they don't see the mucus or they're getting stressed about what type of mucus it is, that's just going to have a negative effect. So, um, you know, and I tend to do a drip feed bit by bit because that way people are likely to take it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I have a few final questions to end the show today. And before I ask them, there's one other question I wanted to ask. Um, and it's m mainly because I've interviewed a few different people about uh, several different types of fertility massage. And I, I feel like they're all different, and they, but they all have certain common threads. And I think this whole topic of bringing circulation and energy and warmth to, you know, our womb to really improve fertility, I feel like it has such powerful implications for women. And I always say, you know, it's such an you know, it's not invasive and it's a way to really improve fertility without having to rely on, you know, medications or anything. I think it's hard to believe how powerful it can be in terms of improving fertility. Um, so, you know, when it comes to like our Vigo therapy and, and mercy therapy and those types of things, um, would, you know, how, how do you describe, um, how do you describe fertility massage therapy kind of uh, you know with those in mind is it is it different is it similar um it is different i particularly with the arvigo i know um i've trained quite a few therapists that have done both my training and the arvigo training um, and they say how different the therapy is um because i've because mine is a lot about uh pulsing and also bringing in the rebozo which is um a shawl that kind of gently rocks the body but it also um wraps the body um, I have a lot of different techniques that I that I've brought in, so it, it feels very very different from Arvigo. I mercy, I can't tell, but I I do know a little bit about um, that they're a little bit more medical with their way of um, giving the massage. I think um, so. I guess a lot of people have said that the work that I do is very very feminine and fluid, and that's probably the way they would describe it. Um, um, it is very hard to, to kind of describe the differences, really, but um, well, just we to all give a kind general of work, idea, I guess. Yeah, I guess we all work the same areas, um, and there's only so many ways that you can work a womb. I guess <laughs> it's just working, um, and a lot of women have come to me and said that they've felt this uh, similar kind of way of working with the womb through their you know, traditional cultures in you know, uh, China and India and uh, Russia and places like that, uh, Nigeria. Um, so it's 
it's just for me it's about working with that woman's body so some people need it more gently some people and I don't have I don't do anything a specific number of times or anything I don't have a specific specific protocol um I have a huge bag which has got a load of tools in it mm-hmm. and then I just kind of tune into that person and use what that person needs mm-hmm. um well no that's that's beautiful and so to get into the final questions for today what would you say is the most important thing that a woman should know when she's trying to get pregnant? The energy of her womb. Really, if she can connect into her body, uh, connect into the wisdom of her womb and know how about calling in her baby, shifting that mindset from I want a baby to I welcome a baby and creating a beautiful energy within her womb, I think that is the most important. Mm-hmm. And what would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you would like to see corrected? <laughs> the IVF fixes everything. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I said that kind of with my, my, my tongue in my cheek. <laughs> and, and, and luckily we're not on video, so I'm kind of smirking to myself. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I think if women were given the chance to, to go to the... To, to nourish their whole body, their physical with their nutrition, you know, the herbs um, and and the emotional aspects and try all of those before jumping into IVF um, because, you know, the medical side of things, it is, there is a core, there is a need for it. I don't get me wrong. There is massively a need for it, but you need to be in a healthy place. Our reproductive organs close down when we're not healthy the only dispensable organ in our body so if fertility isn't working something else isn't right in our body and it's about looking at getting that sorted first before you do anything else because IVF is always going to be much more successful if you've got your nutrition in in place and you've got those foundation blocks because you're going to be healthier yeah it oh so I did an interview (laughs) with um with a, uh, a gentleman named Dr. Thomas Cowan. He co-wrote the book Nourishing Traditions uh, for Baby and Child Care with okay. Sally Fallon. Yes, I um, there, <laughs> Yes. There was one thing that he said that, that it made me think of it when you were saying that. Uh, so he said basically that um, fertility it, it is part of a healthy body. Essentially, it's not separate. And he said, you know, if you go to something like a paraphrasing course, but if you go to a doctor and you say, I can't have a bowel movement, <laughs> the doctor's going to say that's a problem, right? But yep. somehow if you, if you're infertile, it doesn't resonate the same way. Yeah. Cause a healthy yep. body is fertile. Anyways. Um, so yeah. then final question of the day, uh, for a woman who is listening, who's currently on the pill, she knows she doesn't want to get pregnant right now, but she is thinking about pregnancy within the next two to three years. What advice, if any, would you give to her? Uh, I'd say seek out a good naturopath and start getting the vitamins into your body that the pill is depleting from you. The pill will be depleting things like zinc, uh, V vitamins, magnesium. Um, You want to start getting those things restored into the body, getting your liver healthy because, again, because the the pill is depleting the work of the liver. So get those, get started in those foundations in place. And then even if you don't want a baby, I would say come off that pill. You know, start to get to know your body, start to know the mucus so that, I know you might not want to have a baby, but if you know your mucus, you you know when to abstain uh, from intercourse, you get in the nutrition in place um, and start to just reclaim your body, both physically and emotionally. All those beautiful words to end on. Well, Claire, thank you so much for being here today. I had a wonderful time talking to you. It was just, I, I love our conversation that we had. And I really believe that a lot of our listeners, well, I really believe that all of our listeners will get so much out of our conversation today because we touched on so many different things. So I really appreciate you for taking the time to be here today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I had a, a lovely time. I could talk for hours, so I do apologize. <laughs> oh, me too. <laughs> uh, so, and how can our listeners find out more about you, find out more about fertility massage therapy, or if anyone would like to work with you, how would they get in touch? Okay, my website is uh, fertilitymassage.co.uk. 
and when you go on the landing page you'll see there is a an ebook on the side that you can download and it will tell you lots more information about fertility massage um, if you want to work with me or one of my therapies i've got 180 therapists um uh across the world i say across the world we haven't got any in the states yet but we have got them in australia and over that side of the world um and and the uk and, and europe um and you can find those on my website as well or you can always email me and my email is info at fertility uk, and i look forward to hopefully hearing from some of your listeners soon okay perfect well thanks so much claire i had a great time talking with you today sure. thank you thanks lisa Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. So head over to the show notes page and let me know what you found most helpful from today's episode. So you'll find the show notes page at fertilityfriday.com slash 71. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash fertility Fridays with an S on Twitter at Fertile Friday. And if you enjoyed what you heard today, head over to the Fertility Friday Facebook community. So just go to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you'll be redirected to the Fertility Friday Fertility Awareness Facebook group. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. And of course, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list. That way you'll be the first to know when I release a new blog post or a new podcast episode or anything else exciting that's happening at Fertility Friday. And also, if you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, just shoot me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. I love hearing from you. I do appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast. So whether you're on the go, if you're taking me for a walk with you or you're commuting to work, um, I really appreciate you letting me be part of your day. And I really appreciate you supporting the show and hanging out with me for a little while. So as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.